Uh, I guess uh, one deep knee bend there. You can stand, and we'll read this here real quick, and we'll sing that one for our closing song tonight to really mess everything up, all right? Whatever the last one is. I haven't even looked at it yet. Uh, Exodus chapter 1, we're going to read the first 10 verses, and we're going to kind of uh, dive right into this. And <clears throat> again, we have never, I don't believe we've ever studied the book of Exodus. It's Exodus is a, just the story of a exit, okay? And it's about children. And most of us would assume, well, we know that story, uh, but I think that the, the, you'll find there's a lot in the whole story of the book of Exodus. It says this in verse 1, Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob. Reuben and Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar and Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for jo Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died and all his brethren and all his, that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass, that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get up out of the land. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for just the faithfulness of your folks, the ones that are here, the ones that are online tonight. We just pray that you'd help us, Father, as we just study what would be a familiar story for anyone that's been in church for any period of time. But again, we've talked about this much of all the history of any nation that would be recorded. Lord, all that you wanted us to know is recorded in one book that fits in one hand. So God, everything in here is important for a reason. And Lord, this whole story, we'll find out beginning to just introduce it tonight, how important it really is. And we'll thank you for guiding us through it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Freedom from bondage. You know, there's a lot of bondage in America today. Uh, a lot of bondage with uh, alcohol, bondage with drugs. There's bondage with rebellion. People get in a situation where they can't help themselves. You know, there's some people, we, uh, we call them pathological liars. They can't tell the truth even if it's to their advantage. There's, they're in bondage. Uh, and that's not even getting into spiritual bondage. There's a lot of spiritual bondage. And so here we're looking at uh, an entire people that were in bondage, literally a physical bondage. And Egypt has always been likened to the world, and we'll make some of those applications. But tonight, uh, we want to begin on this, this idea of delivered by God's grace. We'll not get all the way through that. And uh, well, there's many other things we'll study out of the book of Exodus, but delivered by God's grace. Throughout scriptures, we see the power of God to deliver out of all and many kinds of bondage. In the New Testament, probably this thing that you would be most mindful of would be Jesus Christ breaking Satan's power. And uh, on the cross and delivering us from the bondage of sin. Uh, Sunday, uh, I w went in my office and somebody had just, every once in a while, somebody will see something that uh, they enjoy. So they'll photocopy it and stick it on my desk. And sometimes maybe they're just trying to tell me out spiritually, I need to work on this. I don't know which is what. But this one's from Friday the 13th. Okay. August 13th, Friday. And it just simply, that day you're supposed to read Psalms 103. And uh, this is a devotional, not, I don't think one that we actually give out in the church. It might be, but if it is, it's one I don't, it's not familiar to me. But it, it's just simply the title Mercy. And it says in Luke 6, 36, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. And if you'll just bear with me for a moment, I do want to read this because they put, they put it so well. It says, The furious buzzing of tiny wings caused me to take a closer look. I saw a fly, freshly caught in a spider's sticky web. I guess that's a Friday the 13th uh, devotion there. The fly, despite a desperate struggle, only entangled itself more hopelessly. Then came the spider quickly spinning her web tightly around the doomed fly. A short struggle ensued, but for the fly, life would soon be over. The spider overcame and thus continued the cycle of life and death. Is there not much similarity between the spider's web and Satan's web? How many people today are struggling in Satan's sticky web of deceit, lust, immorality, impure thoughts, filthy language, unhealthy habits, and so forth? Now, I've watched both. I'm not one to stand around and watch a fly. Now, in Africa, man, they are some spiders. And there are some spider webs, and there are some big bugs that get taken out by spider webs. And so I occasionally, maybe two or three times in my life, I've actually stood and watched a, 
a, a, a bug that's just fine. I've never seen the spider come and get them. I've just seen them stuck and figured, well, that's going to be the end of that. But I have watched so many people's lives. 40 years of ministry. People with every possible blessing and opportunity. God has done everything possible to set them on the best possible path. Put them in the best nation and given them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the devil, a liar and a cheater and a, and a deceiver comes along like a spider and wraps them up in something and absolutely steals everything of life that they could have had. I've seen it far too many times. But this goes on in the devotion says, but praise be to God through Jesus Christ. We have no need to uh, to hopelessly struggle as the fly does. And then Psalms 103, 14 says, for he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. At times we may tend to see God as a stern judgmental figure in the depths of our struggle struggles. We may feel overcome with guilt and despair. Yes, God does require obedience. And he is a jealous God. However, he is also a merciful God. And he remembers our lost state. God can and he will help no matter how deeply we are entangled in Satan's web. The biggest deception of all is to think you can get out without God's help. No bug, no fly can get out of that web without some help. And we can't get out of the devil's web. And then there's just a quote by Charles Luther. It says, Oh, the years in sinning wasted... Could I but recall them now, I would give them to my Savior, to his will I'd gladly bow. We can't go back, folks, but we can go forward. And we can go from this day forward in the grace of God. And so the New Testament, through Jesus Christ, he breaks the power of sin and the power of death through the cross. And then the Old Testament story of the Israelites that we just uh, are going to be studying here in the book of Exodus shows us a physical picture of how God can deliver his people. Egypt, Egypt was a prevailing world superpower. And God performed an amazing story of deliverance for his chosen people. Before uh, Babylon rose to power, before Assyria became an empire, before Rome was ever a thought in anyone's mind, Egypt was the superpower. And in that situation, God worked a great, amazing story of deliverance. Joshua would remind the people of that as they faced new battles in Joshua 24, 17. They've come into the land. They've been through the wilderness now, and they've crossed the Jordan, and they've bought, fought many battles, and now they're in the land. And really, Joshua's about to step out of the picture, and before he steps out of the picture, he wants to remind them the reason they should battle ahead is because what they've seen behind. And he reminds them in Joshua 24, 17, for the Lord our God... He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Joshua said, now listen, Joshua and, and, uh, and Moses were the only ones that uh, uh, had, uh, or Joshua and Caleb, I mean, and Moses were the only ones that had been back there back when all those things happened in Egypt. And now Moses wasn't allowed to go into the land. Uh, so Joshua and Caleb are the only two. And, and really, Joshua was talking to a whole bunch of people. The book of Deuteronomy is about the second giving of the law. These were all young people. They saw what happened in the wilderness, but they didn't see what happened in Egypt. But Joshua had. Joshua had searched out the land for, for the 40 days when uh, the others doubted that they could take the land. And so Joshua was telling them, listen, uh, the Lord, he brought us out of the land of Egypt, which was a superpower, and we were in bondage, which did, uh, and he says, and which did those great th uh, signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. He said, and from the time we left there through the wilderness, all the enemies we fought in the wilderness, all the enemies we fought since we come into the promised land, God has shown us his power to deliver from bondage. The Exodus begins its history around 1850 B.C., before Christ, with Joseph and the rest of the Israelite tribes coming to Egypt when Joseph was a ruler under Pharaoh. And we just read it there. And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. So they were only 70 souls plus Joseph and his family, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And so we think of the Exodus as when they're leaving. No, they had to get in the land before they could be under bondage to leave the land. Later, the birth of Moses is recorded around 1525 B.C. Then the Israelites' actual exodus out of Egypt is around 1445 B.C. Because again, Moses is 80 years old when he walks out, of the land, uh, out into the wilderness. 
Over the years, the uh, families of the children of Israel grew larger, and God continued to bless them. Exodus chapter 1, verse 7, we just read it. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Boy, I couldn't get away from this. You think about this now. For 400 years, they would take the shackles off of Grandpa and put them on the grandson. For 400 years, now, I, I don't know the exact, that, you know, I don't know how long it was before they realized, I don't think that the Egyptians were afraid of them when they went in and they were only 70 people, maybe they're 140 people, and then maybe they're five or 600 people. At some point, they grew so large, they began to fear them. And at some point during that time in Egypt, they literally went into bondage and captivity. The Bible says 400 years, but some of that they were not under the kind of bondage they were as the book of Exodus opens up to us. But by the time we get to the book of Exodus, they're whipping them and they're beating them and they're treating them cruelly on a daily basis. And those are God's chosen people. Well, we, I don't know how the wealth and prosperity preachers get away from that, this story. Oh, you follow God, buddy, and you'll be rich and you'll be wealthy. Tell that to Moses and his bunch. Tell that for, 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 for 400 years to people that woke up every day at the will of the Egyptian people building their great treasure cities and making bricks out of straw and mud. I mean, you have to wonder what kind of a God. What kind of a God says, I'm your deliverer, be my people. Abraham, I'm going to show you great things, and it's going to start out with 400 years of bondage. It's going to start out with 400 years of affliction. Now, you just hang on to us. I mean, we don't, a lot of times we struggle with spiritual things and we struggle with things in our lives because we have this view of God, that God is here to fix everything and to heal everybody and to give us the American dream. And, you know, God is good and God does bless. And God has certainly blessed the children of Israel at times. But that's not what happened for 400 years. And that's how he starts his nation. And I hope to give you an idea tonight why. And in doing so, I hope that when affliction comes into our lives, we might view it a little differently than we normally do. Because even though we say we're not a prosperity gospel church, sometimes prosperity gospel is an American ideology, not a theology. And we have to be careful letting it slip in. From Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, we see the perils of bondage begin to increase for the children of Israel. That's when another king rises up that doesn't know Joseph and things begin to go south. And so we're just going to cover one point tonight. We want to talk about a hateful culture. Egypt became a hateful culture towards God's children. Though the children of Israel were in bondage, they were growing in number, and the spirit of the culture toward them began to change. Have you noticed a change in the spirit of American culture towards Christianity? Now, we look at, you know, the Taliban and how they're going to come in and what Brother Tim said possibly is going on. And if you even have a Bible on your phone, that it could be a cost to your life. And, and they're going to come in and, and they're going to treat it. And we can look back through history and see how that, that uh, Islam has had that uh, relationship with any form of Christianity through the centuries. But we're talking here uh, about a culture that at one point Joseph saved the entire nation of Egypt. Everybody came and said, here's our land, here's our animals, here's our families. You just tell us what you want to do. And Joseph was second in command only to the Pharaoh. I remember when Americans, when I was a young teenager, uh, at 4th of July, man, we would have tabernacle services. We had an auditorium that would seat 1,500. We would leave the comfort of the auditorium, and we'd go out on the back property of Averyville Baptist Church in, 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 in East Peoria, Illinois, and there was a big old tabernacle back there, and we'd spend four or five days out in the uh, sticky uh summer weather there around july 4th and man we'd have guys come in we just preach and we just celebrate america and christianity the culture's changing towards that there are those who would say that everybody that believes in jesus is a january 6th person that people who don't accept alternative lifestyles are the is the hate that's causing holding america back i i'm i'm, I'm mindful of the statement that uh, that, um, oh, now I'm going to draw a blank on who wrote uh, uh, communist uh, thing. Who, who, who was the author of all that? M Marx. Okay, yeah, Lenin brought it to pass in the first culture, but Marx wrote that. He said that religion was the opium of the masses. 
And the reason he said that was because when people were suffering affliction and they turned to God, see, they, the issue is never the issue. The revolution is the issue. You always have to have a revolution. You always have to have unhappy people to have a revolution. And so if you allow God to make people satisfied that he has a plan for their life, there's no revolution. So religion is really a problem for the revolutionary because they want you to be unhappy. You don't have enough. You, life isn't treating you fair, so we got to rise up and fight. And so we find as socialism grows in our country, religion becomes less acceptable because it's the opium of the masses. It will keep you. It will cause you to submit to authority. And let me tell you something. Even in the church, authority has been thrown under the bus quite a bit. And so the, this culture began to change. And they, they had been tolerated as working slaves, but they were becoming intimidating force by sheer numbers, and things began to shift. And the first reason that there was such a shift in the, and the Egyptian culture became so hateful towards uh, the children of Israel was the, they were unfamiliar with Joseph. They were unfamiliar with Joseph. During Egypt's early history, there were many different dynasties. The 17th dynasty was the Hyksos dynasty, and it was during this dynasty that Joseph came to Egypt, and Joseph was elevated and appreciated during that dynasty. But in the 18th dynasty, a new king who did not know Joseph began to rule. See, I, I can't believe that the next king comes along and didn't know the story. And the next king's king comes along, and now Joseph's family's went from 70 to about 100, and they said, oh my, there's 100 people that are going to take over our country. There was some period of time. But eventually another dynasty, and you know a dynasty is just the family keeps inheriting the throne, and then that family dies off, and another family picks up the throne. And so this is a different family that picks up the throne. We really don't get a timeline how long that was, but at some point, the children of Israel become, to this king at least, a threat. This, this one who is ever, and, and, and uh, so, so in, in this 18th dynasty, the new king who did not know Joseph begins to rule in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Verse 9 says, And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. You would kind of say that if they would have taught their history, people would have known what Joseph meant to the nation of, e uh, of Egypt. That's why we have to rewrite our history. It's going to be hard to make an enemy out of God's people if you study our history. Throughout history, Christians have been viewed as troublemakers at times. Many times when people are faithful to the Lord, the culture at large will see them as a problem. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 24, verse 5, For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. That's pretty strong words. Paul's just preaching the gospel. Hey, man, don't die and go to hell. He said, man, he's a pestilent fellow. His religion was bothering them and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Wow, Paul's trying to, Paul never tried to overthrow any government. He was never bound by that stuff. He ta always told people, obey the law as much as you can, although he wrote much of that from prison. But he was always in prison for spiritual reasons, not for political reasons. He says, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. And so the world and culture has often looked at Christians and seen them as the enemy. In the summer of 64 AD, Rome suffered a terrible fire that burned for six days and seven nights, consuming nearly three-fourths of the entire city of Rome. Emperor Nero was blamed by some as starting the fire to watch it burn for simple entertainment. He was crazy. But to kind of cast off uh, blame himself, Nero blamed this new Jewish sect called Christians. Nero, Nero ordered a few of the leaders to be arrested and under torture they accused others, other Christians until the entire Christian populace was implicated and became fair game for retribution. There had always been some problems and some persecutions from the pagans, but now Rome officially as a government, as a world dominating power, in, 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 in 64 AD was the first of 10 major persecutions against the early church. It's interesting that the nation of Israel was birthed 
in the crucible of affliction, of bondage, and the early church was birthed with ten major political, uh, cultural uh, afflictions and persecutions. Where I mean, they were in the Colosseum, fed to the lions, they were made sport of, they were burned. I mean, all the things you read there in the book of Hebrews at the end of chapter 11, this is all going on, and, and people are just terribly treated as a result of an accusation that was not even true. Although culture is often intolerant towards Christians, God's people have always survived and multiplied. Isn't that amazing? Because during those 10 persecutions, because then you get to 313 AD, and Constantine, he decides to marry the church and, and, and Christianity, and in doing so, what he does is he creates the church, and now the church starts persecuting Christians. The established church, I should say. And he takes the power of the government again, but in that time of those ten persecutions under Rome, the church spread around the entire world. It couldn't be stopped. Persecutions never stopped God's people. They were growing stronger in the midst of their captivity. So they were unfamiliar with Joseph. Secondly, they were unfamiliar with Jehovah. The Pharaoh was an idolater serving many other gods. The reason that many of his sins and difficulties existed in Egypt in the first place was simply because the king and the people knew not the Lord. It says that in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, when Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, Listen, uh, the I am, the, the God, our God, he says, Let us go. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? And that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital e, Jehovah, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go. I know not the Lord neither will I let Israel go. The problem is when people don't know the Lord, it's going to be an issue. Our nation is a land that often is unfamiliar with our God, unfamiliar with the Jehovah of the Bible. That wasn't always that way. Even when I was a teenager, more people knew about God and more people respected the Lord. We're getting farther and farther away from that. And that's what Egypt was to God's people. Leaders are removing the Ten Commandments from public places. Leaders are disallowing prayer in public schools, seeking to remove, remove the remembrance of God from any arena they can. Spiritually speaking, in this manner, we live in Egypt today. I know everybody's always said, well, Egypt's a picture of the world. No, we literally are living in a place where they are unfamiliar with Jehovah. He's becoming farther and farther away from their thoughts and their minds. We're surrounded by a culture that does not know Jehovah. Because of this, our opportunity is great to declare, to declare God's glory in a pagan culture. We used to have to get on a boat or on a plane to go someplace to preach to the pagans. We don't have to do that anymore. We live among them. Psalms 96 verse 3 says, Declare His glory among the heathen, His wonders among all people. Let's tell them about Jehovah. Never forget in your seasons of bondage that God is using you to declare His glory in a pagan culture. So they were unfamiliar with Joseph, they were unfamiliar with Jehovah, and then because of that, they were unfair with God's people. They were unfair with God's people. Look at Exodus 1.10, it says, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. This Pharaoh was so paranoid about the children of Israel. While the children of Israel had found refuge under the rule of previous Pharaohs, this Pharaoh was guided by his fears about the Israelites. You have to understand, when they first came into the land, they were welcome. They were basically, uh, in, in many ways, uh, found refuge. They, they were there in Canaan. It wasn't their land yet. They hadn't inherited it yet. And they're starving because of the famine. And so they're taken into Egypt because of Joseph. And Pharaoh welcomes them in the land. But that's not how this Pharaoh is treating them. Genesis 47, 5 and 6 says, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. Listen to this. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. Man, Joseph, you saved our lives. You saved our bacon, man. You made our nation great. You just bring your family on in here and take care of us. And you know, there was a time when people said, thank God for the believers. Thank God for the Christians. Thank God for Jehovah that gave us this great nation. But you know what? We don't need him anymore. We got it from here. And he's not nearly as welcome. And neither is his people as they once were. And so, he says, in the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. I said, listen, Joseph, you got anybody in your family that's a go-getter, put them in charge of my stuff. It was a big cultural change. 
later on as they began to grow and multiply. But this Pharaoh, motivated by fear, became mean and intolerant toward the children of Israel. Exodus 1, 13 and 14 says, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel, listen to this, serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter and uh, with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. And their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. The Bible says it twice under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That word with rigor means with harshness, with severity. The Egyptians treated them cruelly, whipping and beating them. The only materials they were given to make bricks for giant Egyptian structures were straw and mud, and they had to turn those into bricks. However, when the affliction came into their lives, God had a purpose in it, just as he does with affliction in our lives. Now, here's where it gets tough. Deuteronomy 4.20 says this. Now, again, Moses is talking to the new generation that's going to go into the promised land, and others have died in the wilderness because of their unbelief at Kadesh Barnea, not willing to go in when God told them to. And he says in Deuteronomy 4.20, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. He's just saying, Moses is saying, listen, you were forged in a furnace of affliction. Man, we look at that, we say, what kind of a God puts his people in bondage to start out? Now, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, if the children of Israel would have stayed in Canaan, they would have intermarried and dispersed, and there would have never been a Jewish nation. When they went into Egypt, they were an abomination. Even with Joseph, uh, when Joseph uh, fed his brothers, the, the Egyptians would not eat with them because it was an ab abomination for an Egyptian to eat uh, with a Jew. And so basically, by being in slaves and in that lower position, they were able to grow into a great nation without intermingling and intermission. What did they do when they moved into the land and God said not do it? That's the first thing they did. But I think there's more to it than that. I think there's more to it than that. Do you suppose that when God put them for 400 years in a furnace of affliction, that he was looking down through history and he was realizing that the Assyrians were going to come and put them into dispersion? The Babylonians were going to take them into captivity? And, and, and that one day uh, the, that Hitler and his whole Third Reich was going to bring them the Holocaust, and, and now there would be the Muslim Brotherhood? And yet there's one scrappy, tough little people over there in, 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 in the Middle East that you just can't get rid of. Why? Because of how they were raised up. I think God said, there's no way my people are going to survive for centuries to be ready to inherit the kingdom unless I build them out of iron in a furnace. Hold on to that thought as we wrap up. God makes no mistakes. He wastes no trials. He never allows trials into our lives without a purpose and always seeks our purification through the trial. Isaiah 48, 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Job said it in Job 23, 10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. God was allowing them to go through a time of affliction and difficulty so they would be refined and prepared for further use in the service of the Lord. Here's how James 1, 2, and 3 says it in the New Testament. My brethren, fellow believers, followers of Christ, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, when you get into several different troubling afflictions. We have a hard time with that. Count it all joy. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It's very interesting, that word trying of your faith. Trying means the proving or testing of your faith. He's saying, listen, let your faith is going to get tested. It's going to get proved. Whether it's through some big disaster, whether it's through some pandemic or some politics or some personal tragedy or some personal conflict, your faith is going to get tested. And he said, listen, count it all joy when you fall into these different challenges, knowing this, that the testing of your faith, the proving of your faith, worketh patience. And that word patience is very interesting. The Greek word means steadfastness, constancy, endurance. In the New Testament is the characteristic of a man who has not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty of, to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. 
Now, I think here, parents, there's a great warning. God is birthing a nation through 400 years of affliction. And God, who is a perfect parent, says this. He, does, he says, I know that my children must be tried and proved so that nothing is going to stop them from being who they are down the road. And though we don't want our children to be in slavery as such, if we bail our kids out and we never let them struggle and we take their side against everything, they're never going to be able to be patient, constant, steadfast, and standing. And what's going to happen is they're going to cave down the road because we took care of them and bailed them out all the way going. And so oftentimes the greatest servants of God have gone through the furnace of affliction. We don't want our kids to suffer. But sometimes in our desire to make it easy on them, they're not prepared for the temptations that come. And when the trying and proving process happens, they're not ready. And so some people who've been through the battles, you'll notice a lot of times people get saved and within four to six years, they're either in or they're out. Because when the proving comes, they either build their faith or they do not. And God says, listen, I need a nation that's going to endure for thousands of years so that I can finish my uh, prophecy of setting up a kingdom with, with my Christ on the throne of David. And to do that, I'm going to have to start them in a furnace and I'm going to have to basically put the fire to them so that they are iron when they come out of that. And the nation of Israel, there's no explaining their existence with all the enemies they've had through the centuries. And here's the thing, Hitler aside, Muslim Brotherhood aside, Assyria aside, Babylon aside, God knew that Satan himself, an enemy of thousands of years and eons prior to that, were going to be after his chosen people. And if he did not prove them and prepare them to be steadfast and unmovable, no matter what the circumstance would be, he could never fulfill his prophecies. So when God allows, and I know sometimes we bring affliction into our own lives, but even then God allows things to happen to us. He's trying to strengthen his people so that we'll be steadfast and faithful and we'll be made of iron when the testing comes. The 88 strings of a concert piano exert over 45,000 pounds of pressure on its frame. That's over 22 tons of pressure. This pressure, however, is needed for a beautiful music that a piano can produce. And sometimes you have to be put under stress before you're ever going to produce any music. Let me tell you something, spoiled people, people that had everything go right in their life, they can be awful selfish. And they don't always play a good tune when something goes wrong in their life. And so sometimes you say, Lord, why me? Because he's trying to make of you a great instrument of glory. Why do I have to suffer? Because he knows this world is going to be a tough place and he wants you to be standing when it's all said and done. Similarly to this piano and these strings, the pressure in our lives can be a very thing God uses to bring about beauty and purpose. Listen, we would have a very, very tough God if the only reason he put Israel in there to suffer for 400 years was just because he's a mean God. But if he put them there for the purpose of making them strong for the centuries, that means that some of them that suffered affliction never got to see any of the blessings, but they just were a part of the process of building the metal into God's chosen people. A hateful culture, unfamiliar with Joseph, unfamiliar with Jehovah, unfair with his people. Our culture is coming that way, and we better see our fiery furnaces of affliction as God preparing us to go out and be his chosen people. Then we're going to look at a harmful culture because Egypt was harmful. And then we're going to see a helpful hand because when God's ready in his time, I, I, there's some victories along the way, but I'm telling you what, ultimate victory is going to come when that trumpet sounds. And then eventually Jesus is going to come on a white horse and the saint, ten, thousands of thousands of saints are going to come with him. And man, I'm telling you what, uh, that's going to be something. I mean, that, that's going to be like the day they walked out of Egypt, man. That, that was some day. But not everybody got to see that day. And somebody has to be faithful in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ until that day happens. And we all want to be there for the coming of Christ. But until then, we've got to be able to let God build the iron in us so that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is here for when he comes back. He says, when I come back, will I find any faith? Will I find any proven, tried faith 
that stood the test of time. So like I said, the devil, he's in double time attacking. The world is falling down around our ears, and what simple things used to be easy as a child of God are becoming more difficult. But let me tell you something. If you look at this exodus of the nation of Israel, God birthed his chosen people where his Messiah was going to come through by the crucible of afflictions. So God can